Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on an introduction to deficiency of vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin. So we're gonna talk about what this vitamin is. We're also gonna talk about the dietary sources of riboflavin. We're also gonna talk about why we need riboflavin, how it's absorbed, some of the causes of deficiency of riboflavin, and finally, we're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms and ways to diagnose and treat riboflavin deficiency. So what is vitamin B2 or riboflavin? So vitamin B2, first of all, is a water-soluble vitamin. And riboflavin is one of eight B vitamins. So there are seven other B vitamins. Now it's important to recognize that riboflavin is not synthesized in humans and it's not stored, at least not stored to a significant extent. So that means that we have to acquire it from our diet on a continual basis. Why do we need to have it in our diet in the first place? Well, it's required for several processes. I'm gonna talk about these processes in more detail in the next slide, but briefly, riboflavin is important for nutrient metabolism, very important. Glucose, fats, and protein metabolism require riboflavin. So we're gonna talk about this in more detail again in the next slide. It also acts as an antioxidant, and it's important for skin and hair health along with immune system functioning. So what are some of the dietary sources of riboflavin? So some of the dietary sources include dairy products, eggs, grains, greens, and meats. So these are some of the dietary sources where we can get riboflavin. Now the recommended daily intake of riboflavin is anywhere from 1.1 to 1.3 milligrams per day for adults, oftentimes 1.1 milligrams per day for females, 1.3 milligrams per day for males. In pregnant individuals, 1.4 milligrams per day is recommended. And then for individuals who are breastfeeding, 1.6 milligrams per day. So a little bit extra during breastfeeding and pregnancy. So why do we need vitamin B2? Well, it's actually used to make a couple of important cofactors. One of those is flavin mononucleotide. And flavin mononucleotide is an important cofactor for NADH dehydrogenase. So it allows us to actually generate NADH through the enzyme NADH dehydrogenase. So we need flavin mononucleotide to do this. And we get flavin mononucleotide from vitamin B2. It's also used to make flavin adenine dinucleotide, so FAD. And flavin adenine dinucleotide is important for several processes. One of them is for utilization by the enzyme glutathione synthetase. So glutathione synthetase essentially takes a glutathione disulfide and reconverts it back into glutathione. And glutathione is an important antioxidant that is located in the liver. So when the liver is exposed to reactive oxygen species, glutathione is consumed and we need flavin adenine dinucleotide to essentially reconvert this GSSG back into the GSH or glutathione. So that is why we need it in this process. Flavin adenine dinucleotide is also used in the formation of niacin, vitamin B3, from tryptophan. So again, very important process here as well. There's multiple steps, but it's also utilized in this process. And finally, flavin adenine dinucleotide is important in the Krebs cycle. It's used as a carrier of chemical energy. So Flavin adenine dinucleotide can essentially be reduced in the Krebs cycle to FADH2, and then it can be used to generate ATP from mitochondrial complexes. So again, a lot of things you don't really need to know here, but it's important to recognize that a lot of this has to do with energy or nutrient metabolism. So again, flavin mononucleotide used to make NADH, and then flavin adenine dinucleotide has a couple of other processes as well. It regenerates glutathione, it helps to make niacin, and it's utilized in the Krebs cycle for, again, energy and nutrient metabolism. And we can also see that vitamin B2 is involved in maintaining proper levels of collagen as well. So this ties in with skin and hair health. So these are some of the processes whereby vitamin B2 is utilized. How is vitamin B2 absorbed and how is it excreted? So again, we need to ingest it from our diet. Vitamin B2, when it's ingested, enters into the gastrointestinal system. And if it's not in its riboflavin form, it has to be converted from these other forms, flavin adenine dinucleotide, flavin mononucleotide. So if we ingest it in these forms, it has to be processed into riboflavin for us to absorb it. And then riboflavin can be absorbed from the small intestine 
and enter into the bloodstream. And it can be utilized for cellular processes and eventually end up in the kidneys where it gets filtered and excreted in urine. So this is a brief mechanism of the absorption and excretion of vitamin B2. Now that we know how vitamin B2 is absorbed and excreted, what are some of the causes of vitamin B2 deficiency? Now it's important to note before I get into the causes that riboflavin or vitamin B2 deficiency is not common in the Western world. It is more common in Africa and Asia. So now that we know that, let's get into the categories of causes of vitamin B2 deficiency. One of them is poor dietary intake. As we said before, we need to continually ingest it. So if we're not ingesting vitamin B2 readily or frequently, we can have a deficiency. So we can see this in alcoholism. So individuals with chronic alcoholism oftentimes don't eat a whole lot of food, so they are not getting enough riboflavin. We can see this with vegan diets. So although we can get riboflavin from some vegan options like green vegetables and fortified grains and cereals, a lot of times the foods with the most amount of riboflavin are dairy products and certain meats. So certain vegan diets might not achieve enough riboflavin intake. Fasting and starvation is also another cause, again, because essentially the person is not eating enough riboflavin that leads to a deficiency, and anorexia nervosa for the same reason. Another category of causes is decreased absorption. So certain conditions, like certain malabsorptive conditions where an individual is not able to absorb certain vitamins and nutrients properly, may lead to a riboflavin deficiency. One example is celiac disease. Another category of causes of vitamin B2 deficiency is increased utilization. So even though the individual might be eating enough, they're absorbing it properly, they might be using more than they're actually bringing into their body. So these conditions where we see increased utilization include pregnancy. So pregnancy, oftentimes more energy demanding, we're going to be using more vitamin B2. Breastfeeding is also another case where we see this and liver disease as well. And another category of causes of vitamin B2 deficiency include increased losses. So we can see this in chronic diarrhea. So essentially in chronic diarrhea, the vitamin B2 might not even have a chance to be absorbed. It's leaving the gastrointestinal system too quickly. Other cases of increased losses include hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And then there's another category I leave to the side. We're not going to see this as often, but it is a genetic cause of vitamin B2 deficiency known as brown violetto van Leer syndrome. Sorry for my pronunciation. It is an autosomal recessive condition, so it's rare, and it involves issues with intestinal transporters of riboflavin. So again, the categories of causes of riboflavin deficiency include poor dietary intake, decreased absorption, increased utilization, and increased losses, and then rarely genetic causes. Now, vitamin B2 deficiency is associated with certain disease conditions. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the next slide, but I just want to briefly introduce those conditions here. One of those is anemia. So the reason is, is because it's involved in transportation of iron, so intestinal absorption of iron, and also in red blood cell production. Another condition it's associated with is thyroid dysfunction. We can also see eye diseases be associated with vitamin B2 deficiency. These include cataracts and glaucoma. We can even see migraines. So certain individuals who are deficient in riboflavin may be experiencing migraines. So this may be a cause of migraines. And then it's also associated with developmental abnormalities, specifically fetal developmental abnormalities. We're going to talk about these more in detail in the next slide. So what are some of the clinical features of vitamin B2 deficiency? We talked about those associated conditions. So we're going to see things like anemia. And with anemia, you're going to see issues with fatigue. You can see thyroid dysfunction. We can see depression as well. So depression can be a clinical feature of vitamin B2 deficiency. We can see migraines. We mentioned this before. So migraines may be a sign of riboflavin deficiency. Certain eye conditions. Again, we talked about those before. Cataracts, glaucoma, those types of eye conditions. And then more specifically, we can see issues with blurry vision and night blindness. And we mentioned this briefly before, but we talked about vitamin B2 being involved in maintaining proper collagen levels. And this can lead to skin and hair issues if we don't have enough riboflavin. So we can see skin cracking and itching, hair loss, stomatitis, so inflammation of the mouth. And we can also see chelosis, so this is what chelosis looks like here. And we can see that there are irritations and cracking along the corners of the lips. 
We talked about riboflavin deficiency being associated with fetal developmental issues, and these include a cleft lip and palate, delayed growth, and cardiac dysfunction, so different cardiac disorders. And there's some other clinical features as well, throat swelling, so there can be some edema in the throat, liver dysfunction, and even reproductive issues. So we'll briefly talk about how vitamin B2 or riboflavin deficiency is diagnosed and treated. So the diagnosis involves measuring urine excretion of riboflavin. And the treatment involves riboflavin supplementation. And it's preferred with meals. So if an individual is going to take riboflavin supplementation, oftentimes it's in a vitamin B complex multivitamin because a lot of times individuals are also deficient in other B vitamins as well. And it's taken with meals because it's absorbed better. And then with regards to migraines, we talked about this before, there's a connection with riboflavin deficiency in migraines. It seems that individuals who take riboflavin 400 milligrams per day for at least three months may see some benefit in reducing symptoms of migraine. So an interesting point to note here as well. So if you want to learn more about other vitamin deficiencies, please check out my lessons on those topics. I have many lessons on other vitamin deficiencies. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.